Hello everyone! Welcome back to Skyships, and today we will return to space. Let's continue the SpaceX story, but now we will look not at the little firstborn Falcon 1, but at the main and most famous project of the Californian company, Falcon 9. Three, two, one. Lift off Falcon 9. So Falcon 9 is a two-stage medium and heavy lift launch vehicle, developed by SpaceX, well, somewhere around now. Traditionally for us, let's start with the history. Our today's story will begin not from SpaceX, but within the walls of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or, well, yes, it's NASA. In the beginning of the 21st century, the famous American Space Agency was at the strategic crossroads. The old strategy, when this office was in charge of all space programs, did not work anymore. The times when all of American nation united to build giant rockets that would send heroes to the stars passed to the pages of history. The costs were constantly growing, and the results were not. Space shuttle program became obsolete, and now the only impressive things were the costs of launches and maintenance. And finally, the Shuttle Columbia disaster in 2003 killed not only the crew, but the whole program. After 2011, when the program was closed, the only way for astronauts to reach space was the Russian Soyuz rockets. This fact was very amusing for Russians and very annoying for Americans, which again makes the Russians even more cheerful. At the same time, in the United States and the rest of the world, the question has arisen. Are we on a new stage of progress, when not only the giant space agencies would be engaged in space, but also more compact and certainly more flexible organizations, for example private companies? In this case, it's necessary to clarify that I'm talking about a full-scale work in space, from production to operating itself. Rockets in the United States have always been built by the private and public companies, which, however, also grew and became lazy. Although the government officials didn't like the idea at first, it was nevertheless taken into consideration. The attention to the private sector development and the creation of a new space market increased significantly. This strategy pursued two main goals. On one hand, NASA is a giant research center, and it is expected that the agency will concentrate its resources on the space science, giving way to private companies while performing government regulations something like FAA in space. All of this had to optimize costs and focus on the main tasks. On the other hand, the dominance of the United Launch Alliance on the American launch market was in fact a monopoly. This led to degradation of the market competition and of course the progress slowdown and increase of prices. This fact did not help the United States at all. The government had to pay crazy prices and private customers found better companies in Russia, Europe and China. Back in 2006, the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, or COTS program, was initiated to support private companies in their work on the spacecrafts, capable of orbital operations, primarily with the International Space Station. And now, finally, we can return to SpaceX. In 2008 and 2009, two Falcon 1 rockets were successfully launched. These rockets became this company's first success, not so much in terms of the rocket efficiency itself, but in terms of the authority. Those launches proved that guys from SpaceX are serious, and they're claiming a bigger role in the industry. So SpaceX can do rockets. And since the kid is so talented, let's send him to the competition. For example, for the COTS competition, which had already started. Winners of this program shared the NASA funding for the medium lift launch rockets development. $500 million. A good help for the private companies, although in fact it was the cost of one space shuttle launch. 19 companies participated in this race, three of them came out the winners. Orbital Science Corporation, Rocket Plane Kistler and SpaceX. Later, rocket plane Kistler couldn't finish the project and went bankrupt. For several years, SpaceX was receiving a $396 million grant to create the Falcon 9 rocket and the Dragon spacecraft. 
Orbital received $288 million for their Antares and Cygnus projects. In 2008, NASA started the second stage of their strategy, the CRS – Commercial Resupply Services Program. In it, SpaceX and Orbital Science received $1.6 and $1.9 billion contracts for cargo delivery to the ISS with their rockets and spacecrafts. Due to the COTS and CRS programs, SpaceX could significantly accelerate the Falcon 9 development. In addition, the special NASA COTS office provided technical consulting to the program's participants. However, to the lack of the financial and labor resources, SpaceX had to close down the Falcon 1 project and cancel the creation of the bigger Falcon 5 rocket. The COTS program had one important condition. It was started only to support and accelerate the growth of the private developers. NASA initially told the participants that it is not a direct customer of their products and will not pay for all the work. SpaceX and Orbital Science must perform the development on their own and in the future operate their rockets independently, not counting exclusively on government support. Here we can recall all those adventures that the F-35 JSF program created for the Pentagon. Because Lockheed Martin knows that the military have no real alternatives. So now the space businessmen were told, if you're successful, good for you. If you go bankrupt, no one's going to miss you. After all, rocket plane Kestler was also a finalist of the COTS program. Where is it now? This plan worked. In 2014, SpaceX published a report saying that the Falcon 9 and Dragon R&D program had cost nearly $850 million, including the NASA grant. According to the NASA and US Air Force calculations, by the year 2017 the program will cost about $1.7 billion, which is quite laughable for the American aerospace industry. According to their estimates, if the work was done by NASA itself, the expenses would be two, three times bigger. For example, they have already spent $7 billion on the SLS rocket during the last four years. Yes, this rocket is much bigger and it is super heavy class, but you know, $7 billion is a huge amount. According to tradition, Elon Musk announced that we will see Falcon 9's first launch in 2009. However, development reality and government bureaucracy didn't agree with him. But the work still moved fast. By the end of 2009, SpaceX had already conducted fire tests of the stages at their McGregor facility. In 2010, the Cape Canaveral station witnessed the fully assembled Falcon 9 for the first time. The production became a special adventure. The old factory where the small Falcon 1 rockets were made was not fit for the new rockets, and the company moved. Not too far though, to the Hawthorne, near Los Angeles. SpaceX took an old factory, formerly owned by Northrop Grumman. This area is now a basis for SpaceX. On June 4, 2010, the Falcon 9 rocket was launched for the first time. A model of the Dragon spaceship with the test payload. This mission was a part of the SpaceX's own test program. In December, the COTS test and certification program started with the real Dragon spaceship. The flight was successful. The capsule flew around the Earth twice and splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. After the test, SpaceX entered the long and boring certification program of the rocket, components and production line. The final test launch was in spring of 2012, when the Dragon capsule docked to the ISS for the first time. The Falcon 9 was officially recognized as a launch rocket. The COTS program was complete and SpaceX started carrying out its part of the contract, delivering cargo to the space station. So what are the flight statistics? By the end of 2017, Falcon 9 was launched 46 times. 44 launches were considered successful. However, there were two accidents with the rocket. The first of them happened in 2015. During the flight, there was a disintegration of the second stage liquid oxygen tank that caused an overpressure, leading to the vehicle breakup. The second accident occurred in 2016. In the process of refueling, liquid oxygen ignited and the rocket exploded at the launch pad. This accident caused many different theories, up to the versions about the competitor's sabotage. 
However, the investigation showed that the explosion was caused by the stratification of the fuel tank and oxygen ignition. The launch frequency has grown in recent years. Moreover, during the period of 2013 to 2016, this figure fluctuated between 7 and 8. Then, in 2017, when SpaceX started the Falcon 9 FT launches, the number grew to 18. In the modern space launch industry it is a very big number for one company. SpaceX is using three launch sites at the Kennedy Space Station, Vanderburg Air Force Base and Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Also, the company is building a new commercial launch pad in Texas, which should start operating at the end of 2018. In 2017, out of 18 launches, 12 were made under the contracts with customers from the United States. Four of them were NASA contracts for cargo delivery to ISS and two for military and special services. Six orders were fully commercial. Another six launches were carried out by the order of the foreign customers. One rocket brought two large satellites from USA and Europe. Ok, enough numbers. Let's see what this rocket is in fact. Falcon 9 is a family of two stage to orbit medium lift class launch rockets. According to design specifications, it is mostly a classic rocket. Mostly. The first stage is equipped with nine Merlin engines. Therefore, the rocket is called Falcon 9. These engines are using RP-1 kerosene and liquid oxygen as rocket propellants in two aluminum-lithium alloy tanks. The second stage is maximally unified with the first one, as its simpler version. Power plant, one Merlin vacuum engine, adapted to work in space. The fuel is the same, RP-1 and liquid oxygen. The fuel tanks in both stages are compressed with helium to maintain the required pressure. Helium is an inert gas, and it is the safest substance in the rocket. Ironically, both of the accidents with the Falcon 9 occurred because of the helium tanks. The payload, except for the Dragon spacecraft, is covered with 13 meters long and 5.2 meters wide fairing. In terms of flight reliability, Falcon 9's level is quite high with an indicator of approximately 96%. It is good for the launch market, although it doesn't reach the industry leaders of this factor, the Soyuz rockets, with their 98% reliability. This level of reliability for a rather young product is the result of a very demanding test program that the rocket passes before launch. The last of these checks is performed directly on the launch pad, at the time of the start. After starting the engines, the rocket is still being held on the site for a few seconds, until an all-system diagnostic is complete. If everything is ok, the rocket starts. If a malfunction is detected, the start can be cancelled. This practice has already taken place in the rocket industry, but before that it was used in manned flights, when the safety requirements are at maximum. The presence of nine first-stage engines also ensures flight safety even in the event of a partial failure. This was confirmed during the first mission of CRS-1, when one of the engines failed, but the Dragon capsule still successfully arrived to the International Space Station. And this awesome moment will be the end of today's video. Let's consider it the first part of the Falcon 9 story. Come back next week for part 2. There will be fewer stories and more descriptions of why everyone is so excited about this rocket. Subscribe, like and comment what you think about it. Fast flights and safe launches to you.